Hey, Lab Code agents, it is time for another webinar. I'm Nick Baldwin. I got Tristan Almada here. And today we have a pretty unbelievable guest. Um, and it's Bob Berg, the author of The Go Giver. And what we're going to talk about is can a subtle shift in focus really make that big of a difference in your business and your income? Well, Bob says absolutely yes, it can. As I said, Bob's the author of a number of books on sales, including The Go-Giver, uh, books on marketing and influence with a total book sales of well over a million copies. Wow. His book, The Go-Giver, which is co-authored by John David Mann, has sold over half a million copies and has been translated into 21 languages, which is 20 more languages than I can speak. It has been reissued in a new expanded edition with a forward by Ariana Huffington, founder of the Huffington Post. And Bob would like you to know that he's an advocate and supporter and defender of the free enterprise system. And he believes that the amount of money one makes is directly proportionate to how many people they serve, which is uh, pretty amazing and, and, and kind of goes along the lines of, of the real estate business and how agents are running their business these days. I want to find my copy of The Go-Giver right here. If you don't have it, go pick it up. If you haven't read it, shame on you. Everyone, let's give a round of applause to Bob Berg. Thanks for coming on Lab Code Agents Thank today. You. Thanks for being on, Bob. Oh, it's great from, to be here. From sunny Jupiter, Florida. That's right. Uh, so we're just going to get right into it. Uh, We've only got 30 minutes with you, Bob, so we're going to take advantage of this. So, Bob, I just read the book, man. I, I, I actually hadn't read it. I'd seen it. I, I read the other book that you have, the, the little green book. That one I, I got as a gift from somebody in our group. They sent it to What's me. What's the little green book called, Tristan? It's called Se it starts with a sell. sell More. Yeah, there you go. That's the one. <laughs> That's the one. I'm terrible at titles, Bob. That's okay. Um, but I so I just read the the little red book. So I'm good with colors, Bob. That's probably the most <laughs> Well, that's important. It. The little red book and the little green book. Uh, but what what's the premise of the book itself, Bob? Can you can you tell it in your words? Sure. And, and again, the, the red one is a parable. The green one is more of the application. The red one is a, a business parable co-authored with John David Mann, who you were kind enough to mention. He's a great guy, fantastic writer and storyteller. And uh, he's just great. And the, the basic premise is simply this, that shifting your focus, and this is the key, shifting your focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing value to others. And that doing so is not only a, a nice way, a pleasant way to conduct business, it's a very, it's the most financially profitable way as well. Interesting. Okay, so can you tell me why, why you decided to, to go with a story outline instead of a how-to on the first one? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that stories, um, tend to connect with people and they connect on a very deep emotional level. And again, when you have a great storyteller like Judd, you know, cause I'm a how to guy, I'm step one, step two, my first book, endless referrals, right? That was how to, right? Uh, John's a great, great storyteller. So, um, so when you can do something like that, I think that it's, um, uh, I, I think that it's a way to really connect with the readers. So, and I've always found myself throughout the years, I've read, Gosh, I was going to say dozens, probably hundreds of parables, if there are hundreds out there. I love them, right? You can read them in an hour, two hours. You get a good message and you feel. And so, you know, that's why we did it in that. That's why we did the first one uh, that way. Makes sense. It reads really, really fast, really easy. And it's uh, really comprehensible too. So, and there's a realtor, a real, a real estate professional in that in that story too. Yeah, we're, just, yeah, we're going to talk about Deborah later on in, Deborah. in the book. I thought that was great. <laughs> So, um, Tristan, yeah, I, I was Tristan. And I are curious of why you decided to write this one uh, as a parable and not as like more of a how-to. Well, he just answered that. You got oh, cut really? off. okay. You know what happened? I cut out my internet connection. Cut out for a second. So, oh, sorry. Right. on to the next one. You got awesome. it. So, you know, in the book, obviously, it's there's five really important laws. The five. Um, stratospheric laws of success. Can we go over what those five laws are in case some of our viewers don't know? Sure. The laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, 
influence, authenticity, and receptivity. And they work in tandem all together. It's not one, two, three, or even four of those laws. It's utilizing all five of them. The first one's the law of value. This is sort of the foundational law or foundational principle. And it says your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Now, this can be confusing when you first hear it, sort of counterintuitive. Uh, mm -hmm. I get more in value than I take in payment. I, that sounds like a recipe for bankruptcy. How am I supposed to provide <laughs> right? No, not at all. We simply have to understand the difference between price and value. Price is a dollar figure. It's a dollar amount. It's finite. Uh, value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea that brings with it so much worth that someone will willingly, uh, which is the basis of a free market exchange, both people exchange willingly, um, that they'll, they'll exchange their money and feel great about it while you make a very healthy profit. Just quick example, as a, uh, a real estate professional, um, you list someone's home, you charge them a, a, a percentage or a fee or commission, however you want to call it. Well, what you're doing, though, is you're giving them so much more in value than what they're paying you. Uh, of course, in the ease of which they're, they get to sell their home, you're handling the negotiations, you're handling the advertising, you know how to do it with your professional expertise, you bring so much to the table that they would never be able to do and get the right, the same price and the same time period and be able to navigate their way around it that you bring with your value. So you're giving them more in value than what you're taking in payment, but you're still making a very healthy profit. The main characteristic of a free market-based exchange is that both parties come away better off after the transaction than they were before the transaction. Got now, it. if I may just add one more thing. What While, is you know, in, and we talk about value, and yes, you're giving them much more in value than what they're paying, but remember that alone, that's the intrinsic value of what you're offering. But any other real estate professional can either do that or they can say that they can do that, right? So what you've got to do is you've got to be the one that is positioned as separate, unique, and as my colleague Scott McCain would say, um, uh, distinct from your competition, okay? How do you do that? Well, you've got to be that additional value. Because remember, if the prospective uh, listing client or the prospective buying client sees no difference or customer sees no difference in two or more real estate professionals, it's always going to come down to who has the lowest fee. And that's not where you want to go. Unless your last name is Walmart, okay? <laughs> your unique selling proposition is not a constructive way, a productive way, a profitable way, a fun way, a gratifying way to do business. So no. Uh, so so how do you become that additional? Remember, when you sell on low price, you're a commodity. When you sell on high value, you're a resource. So how do you separate yourself from the field? And there are probably hundreds of ways to communicate that additional value, but they tend to come down to five, what we call elements of value. And those five are excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And to the degree uh, that you can communicate one or more or hopefully all five of those elements of value at every single touch point with this person, that's the degree that you will separate yourself and take fee out of the conversation. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of real estate agents are torn between, you know, how, how much, well, especially beforehand when they're going in for the listing consultation, you know, how much do I give or share with this potential client, uh, you know, before I actually have them sign on the dotted line, right? I mean, it's how much guidance or advice and how much am I sharing with them before I'm giving away too much. So well, I think, you know, what agents are having an issue, uh, uh, having a conflict with is what's that, what's that balance that we should have? Well, here's the thing. Share your knowledge, share your wisdom. That's okay. Because as you do this, 
they're still going to know that they cannot do it as effectively without you. If you try to really withhold knowledge, okay, there's always someone else who's going to be able to, to, to come up with that knowledge, okay? If you, if you, if you uh, hold back on that, you're not really adding any value to them other than saying, hey, what I want is your listing. And hey, no one is going to list their home with you because you have a quota to meet or because you need the money or because you just are a nice person who feels you could do a great job. No, they're going to list with you only because they believe they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And that's the only reason they should. So the more information, counsel, guidance you give them, that's fine. But remember, especially in real estate, there's a big difference between hearing how to do something and having someone who can guide you through the process. And so, you know, my, my feeling is to the belief and, and just from what I know of the many successful real estate agents, that to the degree that they know you're that person, not only with the information, but who wants to guide them, that's the degree you are, are more than likely to get that listing. Makes sense. Well, well, from reading the book, and I know question, Tristan has another question for you. I loved the law of authenticity because authenticity, that was specifically the chapter about Deborah, the real estate agent. Right. <laughs> so when I was reading that, it was a really exciting chapter, and we'll, we'll go more into it. But um, I don't want to – but I, I know that Tristan has a question for you. No, I don't. I just wanted him to go on to the law of compensation just so that we can go over that too. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Sure. The law of compensation says that your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives you touch with the exceptional value you provide, uh, the more money with which you'll be rewarded. So as Nicole, the CEO in the story, one of the mentors tells Joe, the protege, law number one, the law of value, as important as that is, that represents only your potential income. The law of compensation, the number of lives you impact with that value, that's what equals your actual income. Okay. And I think, you know, what you said earlier about, you know, the amount of the, the, amount, the amount of your income directly impacts the amount of people you can reach or service on a regular basis. I mean, go, fits right into, I mean, any business really, but with real estate, the, the uprising of the real estate team, uh, you know, the expansion teams with agents taking their teams from one location and bringing it over to another. I mean, it's, it, it goes right, Tristan, right? I mean, it goes, Tristan has a team of 18 people. I mean, I have a team of six, and every day, every uh, the more the more we bring in, the more people we're, we're able to 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 reach. So, you know, yeah. teams are really making making uh, big strides in this industry. And um, you know, yeah, and and this is where it's so important to focus on the value aspect. It, the you know, the value comes first. This is why we say that money is simply an echo of value. It's the thunder to values lightning, which means nothing more than that the value must be the focus. The value comes first, and the money you receive is simply a very natural result of the value you provide. Makes sense, man. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about um, – I want to talk a little bit about – well, I wanted to talk – I want to read something from the book, actually, about the chapter on Deborah, okay. because in our group, Lab Code Agents – you know, there's a lot of people talking about, uh, you know, what should I do? What kind of car should I drive? What kind of clothes should I wear? And Deborah says something really interesting as the mega agent in the book, and she's speaking at a conference. She said that um, over the years, what really, and I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, what worked best for her was just how to be a friend, right? Like people want to work with people that they can relate to and that they trust and that they like. So, you know, if you're trying to be this other person, you know, if wearing a suit, obviously I'm not a suit guy, neither is Tristan, isn't your thing. Don't try to be that guy, you know, be you and people are going to work with you because of who you are. So I really related to that, that section of the book. Well, you bring up a great point, and it, it also sort of dovetails from law number three, the law of influence, which, which says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. 
Now, also counterintuitive, right? It doesn't seem to make sense, but then you think about it, the greatest leaders, the top influencers, the most profitable sales professionals, this is simply how they run their lives and conduct their businesses. They're always looking to bring value uh, to help others achieve. Now, I wanna just also qualify that if I may, because this can easily be misconstrued and, and misunderstood, and I think it's very important. When we say place the other person's interests first, we certainly don't mean you should be anyone's doormat or that <laughs> you should be right, that you should uh, uh, be a martyr or self-sacrificial. Uh, it doesn't mean take the listing without being paid, right? No, it doesn't mean any of that. It simply <laughs> means that you understand as Joe, the protege learned from several of the mentors that the golden rule of business is simply that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you in others than by, and now we go back to, genuinely and authentically moving from what we call an I focus or me focus to an other focus looking for ways to, as uh, Sam, one of the mentors in the story advised Joe, to make your win about the other person's win. You know, you look at a guy like uh, Michael Mayer, who is a friend of all of ours. By the way, I just want to give a shout out to Michael because we wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for Michael. He introduced us. Well, you know, yeah, he's a guy from the moment I've, I've known Michael, all he has, all I've ever seen him do is look for ways to make other people's lives better. And this is Michael, uh, that is who he is. Y and we say in the book, uh, you know, it's not that you, you, you don't give in order to get something from it. You give value to others because it's what you, it's congruent with your values. It's what you do, it's, it's who you are. And because it's who you are, it's what you do. Now you look at someone like Michael who has received at one point, I think he was number two or number one, whatever in, in all of North America in receiving referrals. And what was Michael's motto? We're not number one, you are. That's a Michael Mayer statement, okay? That's law three, placing the other person's interest first, but it's law number four because it's authentic. And there's not one person who knows Michael who wouldn't say that's him. Very true. I see what you're saying. So here's a question because it, it goes into the next law, which is your last law. The, uh, right, law of receptivity. Yeah. and. I, when I was reading the book, I'm like, wow, you know, I, I've always had a challenge of actually receiving because I, I just, we've just been giving, giving, and I have a big challenge receiving. I'm like, holy crap, this book's talking to me. I'm pretty sure everybody feels that the book's talking to them. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> but how do you, how do you deal with, with just giving and giving and then just changing that mindset to actually start receiving? This is the key. The key is within that great question. You don't change your mindset. It's that you realize that there's no dichotomy between giving and receiving. Uh, see, the law of receptivity simply says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. And this means nothing more than understanding that we both breathe out and breathe. Yeah, I remember that. In, right? Yeah. We, we breathe out carbon dioxide. We breathe in uh, oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving. We breathe in, which is receiving. Now, contrary to the message that we get from the world around us, uh, giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. So it's not, are you a giver or a receiver? It's that you're a giver of exceptional value to everyone. You're a giver and a receiver. But the focus is on the giving. When you've given value to so many people, you've placed their interest first, you've done so authentically, now you allow yourself to be open to the receiving. And it's just all one flow. And, and that's really how it, so when you can take that, uh, that uh, mindset and begin to really embrace it, all of a sudden those self-sabotaging things and those, that, that treacherous <laughs> dichotomy of, you know, givers or reasons, it goes away and you start finding. So we've had, John David Mann and I have had more emails about that one chapter because you're right, that is the toughest. 
Yeah. Uh, and but once you get that, we've had people thanking us for permission to finally receive. And it's of course not <laughs> us giving them permission. It's something they saw in the book and they just simply related it themselves. Yeah, I agree. I wanted to make a point because um, because you know in real estate, uh, especially if you're running a team like Tristan and I have teams, mm -hmm. you know, placing other people first doesn't necessarily mean your clients. It also means your team members, your agents. Sure. And in our Lab Code Agents group, you know, we get a lot of people asking, should I start a team? And, and if I should, how should I do it? And everyone says, oh, read this, talk to this person, go here, take this class. But really, like, for me, I believe that before you decide if you start a team, the first question you should ask yourself is, can I be a good leader and can I place other people's successes over my own? And if that answer is no, then you are not ready to start a team. So it, it, it also falls in line of placing your agents or whoever else is on your team way before you. If they're not succeeding, then your team is failing. And if you can't have that mindset, then you need to wait until you can. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the, the um, characteristics of a true leader, someone we would call a go-giver leader, is that, you know, again, it comes down to placing the interests of those they lead first. See, great leadership is never about the leader. Great influence is never about the influencer, just as great salesmanship is never about the salesperson. Who is it about? It's about the other person. It's about everyone whose lives you choose to touch, which means when you have someone on your team, your goal is to help them to the degree you do that. That's also the degree that you're going to uh, uh, exceed your own expectations. 100% totally agree. Um, so, so l let me ask you how the go giver, how does like, if you want to actually, you know, you say in the book, don't be a, you know, don't uh, being a go getter is not necessarily a bad thing. Right. But yeah, no, we give. love go, go getter. Go yeah, get like go getters, Right. Like action, right? Um, <laughs> go takers. <Yeah. laughs> be a, be a go getter, a person of action and a go giver, someone whose focus is totally on bringing value to others. Just don't be a go taker. That's the person who feels. Oh, I got you. Is that your next book, Bob? Don't be a go taker. Don't be a go. Be a go giver. <laughs> be a go getter and a go giver. Just don't be a go taker. That's funny. So, Bob, the the five laws. Where where did they come from? How did you guys come up with it? Uh, this is simply something. You know, John and I were both entrepreneurs, and and uh, uh, and I've certainly by having the pleasure to speak at so many conferences and 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 conventions and so forth i get to meet all these great leaders and, and get to see and all these great producers and i'm a you know i'm a i guess an interviewer by by uh, nature i always want to know what made you successful i love studying success i love reading about success and you also learn about failures and certainly i've had my share of failures and my share of successes we're human beings it's, it's all of us and John, again, a successful entrepreneur and someone who's a writer and has gotten to interview these people, and we just kind of got together and said, so what is it that, you know, the, the determining factors, what is it that makes people successful? And we could boil them down to these five laws. And the laws sort of, I won't say they wrote themselves because we sort of had the, you know, but they kind of did write themselves in certain ways. Uh, so I don't think there's anything new about these. I think successful people from the time there's been market economies, they've, they've tapped into these laws, some of them knowingly, some of them just intuitively. Uh, but, you know, these are basic. That's why we say, though, it's, it's important to follow all five of them, because if you take any one of them away, uh, you won't be nearly as successful as you could be. Very true. Hey, Bob. So I was uh, on a plane recently, and I was watching the movie The Founder. Um, about Ray Kroc. Yeah. And so it got me thinking, I mean, Ray Kroc was like a go taker, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it can be argued whether what he was doing was the right way or, or, or the wrong way. But I feel like there's been a shift, right? So you, t you talk about someone like him in the 19, was it the fifties when McDonald's was founded or sixties? Seven or 58 is one. Of yeah. Those. 
he bought it from the McDonald's brothers. Yeah, and so you have the and when he, and yeah. Oh, so go ahead. It was started in the late fifties, is when he started to kind of take it over and build it. I did not see the movie, by the way. I read his book called Grinding yeah. It Out. So that would be any knowledge I have of of Ray Kroc would be from that. So so go ahead, not from this movie. So go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. So so um, so I. It's interesting because I feel like there was a shift, and maybe the shift happened. Um, and during the rise of social media or during the rise of when, you know, no, where privacy sort of started to um, fade away. But I feel like there's been a shift in, 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 the, in the mindset of CEOs, right? So Ray Kroc was like a shark. He had like this shark-like mentality, whereas now you, you have these CEOs who have like a sharing and an adding value and a mentor-like mentality. When you think that shift started to happen because this is kind of what I'm seeing from, from these CEOs now, as opposed to, you know, in the days of the sharks. Well, first, I think that as economies shift and there, and we're now much more into an information economy and there's, there's um, so much now out there. It's awfully difficult for people to keep things too, too secret as far as what they're doing that doesn't work. People can communicate with each other. And I think more and more information is coming out that, the leaders who genuinely care about their people and genuinely care about others make more money, okay? They do better. Now, let's go back for a second to, to someone like Ray Kroc. And again, I, I didn't see the movie. Uh, and I don't know whether he was, I, you know, all I did was read his books. I don't know if he's a nice guy or not. And it's the same, I get people asking about Steve Jobs, who was known as not being a, but let's look at, whether they fulfilled the laws of the go-giver, okay? Now, with Ray Kroc basically gave value in two types of ways. One was to the consumer. Now, someone might say, well, hamburgers and fast food isn't really value. But remember, value is in the eyes of the beholder, okay? True. So people who want yeah. hamburgers and French fries and shakes has value to them, and they're willing to pay for it. Okay, so did he give more in value than he took in payment? Well, yes, because people wouldn't have uh, bought if they didn't feel they were getting more in value. He also sold franchises to people for a certain amount of money, and these people made a lot of money from these franchises. Now, again, I don't know if there was anything. If there's anything that Croc did that was against the law or unethical, then again, no, not a go-giver because it's it's totally. But but I'm I don't know that part, and that's not, and I'm assuming that's not the case. He was just a tough businessman who did things in a certain way. Now, so the law of value, yeah, passes. Law number two, um, uh, touching more lives. Well, I don't know. I'd say with about 10,000 franchises, all the money he's made other help other people make who are his franchisees, plus all the customers who enjoyed the experience at McDonald's, yeah, touched a lot of lives. Oh, yeah. Now, place the other people's interests first. I'm going to say yes, and here's why. Because no one's going to buy a hamburger if they don't like it. He would test out, remember when the Egg McMuffin first came out, and I don't know if they covered that in the movie, but he was not for the idea at first. They tested it in a few stores in Southern California. Had, had it not tested well, he'd have said, no, it's not going to happen, because he had to place the customer's interest first. Got okay? it. Now, in terms of his franchisees, he could drive as hard a bargain as he thought he could get away with, but if it wasn't something that his franchises liked enough and valued enough, they weren't going to buy from him. So he had to play. Was he authentic? I, well, I take that. I don't think anyone argues with that. And was he? did he receive? Yeah. He made a lot of money. And <laughs> wow. so that was an easy No-giver. Well, so I'm going to say that what happens sometimes is I think people – and it's very natural. They confuse being a nice, warm, and fuzzy person mm. with being a go-giver, okay? Really, what a go-giver is is someone who uh, follows those five laws and places the other interests first. And Ray Kroc would be the first to say that, remember, he's a guy who, when he'd go to a franchise and the, the, the uh, parking lot was dirty, he'd clean it up. Not because he was a nice guy. He cleaned it up because he knew his customers were going to like his store better if it was a clean, you know. So, so I'm just saying we want to make sure that we we um, really kind of get that. You know, there's plenty of people who are nice guys, nice gals, nice people um, who are not successful in business. Uh, plenty of people who give stuff away 
they're not necessarily go givers, they're just givers. So I just want to make sure that we understand that we are talking yeah, about principles different. of success that it's interesting because there's different, I guess it's different. It's interesting because there's, you know, on from, 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 from certain perceptions, it might not seem as if, you know, they're, they, they fit into the actual mold when in actuality, I guess there's different types, you know, but as Absolutely. long as Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely hit all five laws. That's pretty amazing. Well, um, Bob, uh, we've run out of time, man. It went, uh, those 30 minutes went really quick. Do you want to yeah, end was, with, um, amazing. wise words to real estate agents? Uh, do we have two more minutes or are we? Yeah. Uh, oh no, we're good. No, no, I mean, okay. we, have, we, we have another hour, but I know you don't want to. <laughs> we, can, we can talk as long as you want. But. Here's what I would, would say. And I, I learned this close to 30 years ago, I guess. Uh, I had been in sales for a couple of years. I'd been doing well because I studied sales. I learned it. I went to seminars. I bought books. I bought back then tapes, right? Not the cassette tapes. I was always learning and studying and I was doing well. But I really, I was not realizing my potential. And it was because like Joe in the story, my focus was in the wrong place. And I remember coming back to the office of the company I was selling for at the time. And an older guy, and I say older guy, probably my age now, <laughs> but back then he was an older guy. Sure. And I remember he, he, he kind of saw the disgusted look I had on my face. And I think he saw me as someone with a lot of potential who was not realizing that potential. And he was right. And he said, Berg, can I give you some advice? And I said, yeah, a a absolutely. And he said, if you want to make a lot of money in business, actually he said, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target, he said, is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, he continued, you'll get a reward. And that reward will come in the form of money. But never forget, that the, the money is only the reward for hitting the target. It's not the target itself. The target is serving others. Wow. And ah. that was the shift that I needed. And I think if, the, if, if any real estate professional can keep their, their focus there, okay, I think they're nine steps ahead of the game in a 10-step game. I think, yeah, it definitely comes down to passion you know, is what you're saying is that you have to be passionate about what you do. And if you put money first, um, and that's going to, you know, that's going to be kind of some tunnel vision there. Your, your, your customers are going to know, are going to realize that. So I totally agree with that. Thanks, Bob. We really appreciate you being here, man. You dropped some heavy knowledge on all of us. Yeah. So really appreciate that. Man. And Bob, the book, if no, if you haven't read the book, the go giver, I mean, it's, it's literally like 127 pages packed full of amazing knowledge. You can read it in one day. You'll read it over and over, but pick it up. And uh, but let's talk just real quick, Bob. You have a new Go-Giver course. Why don't you tell everyone about that real quickly? Sure. Um, and they, if they go to thegogiver.com, without the hype, and thegogiver.com, uh, they can get chapter one of the book to see if they like as to how the story begins, they can always then click through to Amazon if they like to uh, to buy the book. They can also um, uh, get involved in the Go Giver Way, which is a, a free thing we put out every uh, uh, morning on Facebook. A quote, inspirational quote from the day. They can subscribe if they'd like to my Go Giver podcast. Uh, and as you were kind enough to mention, we have a course called Sell the Go Giver Way. It's just a 60-minute. It's audio and totally transcribed, and it's it's basically, and it's not real estate specific, but it's when you're in front of a person, why is that person going to buy from you or why won't they? And we take you through it, including how to respond correctly with objections. And um, so far we've had just wonderful, wonderful response uh, to this program. So they can go to, I think you all have the, um, the direct uh, link yep. to it. Kristen has a link, I'm gonna post side. it up. Yeah, put the link on everything. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. This is great. We really appreciate you being here. We know you're a busy guy, so we appreciate you taking 35 minutes out of your day to talk to us. That's um, that's a go-giver way right there. I appreciate you all a lot, and I, I love what you're doing, and I, I wish you all the best of success. And everyone listening, I, I wish you the best of success. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thanks so much.